Hello everyone. So lately I've been enjoying this method of evaluating integrals by first differentiating them with respect to some parameter. And today I wanted to share another pretty cool example of an integral that we can evaluate using this technique. So the integral we're going to look at is the integral from zero to infinity of dt over one plus t to the x times one plus t squared. And so x is a parameter that we put into this integral. Uh, and so I've written it here as i of x, right? So the first thing we're going to do towards evaluating this, there are various ways to do this, by the way, but what we're going to do is differentiate i with respect to its parameter x. Okay, so let's find di by dx. And what we can do is put the derivative with respect to x inside the integral. So we can write that as the integral from zero to infinity of d by dx of uh, well, the entire integrand, basically, um, which is 1 plus t to the x to the minus 1. I'm writing this as uh, as a power now so that it's a bit easier to differentiate. Um, and then times 1 plus t squared to the minus 1. Uh, and that is still with respect to t. So let's do the differentiation. Uh, we're going to find that di by dx is the integral from 0 to infinity. Uh, then what's going to happen when we integrate this stuff inside the square brackets? Well, uh, the first term, we're going to use the chain rule, okay? So we pull down this factor of minus 1, so we get minus 1 plus t to the x, and then we decrease our power by, power by 1, so that becomes minus 2. And then from the chain rule, we have to multiply that by d by dx of the stuff inside these brackets, um, and so that's just d by dx of t to the x, because d by dx of 1 is 0. All right, so we do that, we've used the chain rule, and actually the second part of uh, the square bracketed term doesn't even depend on x, so we can just keep that as it is, actually. So 1 plus t squared to the minus 1 dt. Um, and all right, so how do we do this differentiation of t to the x? Well, when we differentiate an exponential term, like this, um, we get the same thing multiplied by the natural log of t. Okay, um, and so yeah, we can just take this t to the x ln t uh, and use that to rewrite our integrand. And so what it's going to be is the integral from 0 to infinity of minus t to the x ln t, uh, and then that is going to be divided by 1 plus t to the x squared now, uh, and then 1 plus t squared, uh, and that is with respect to t. Okay, so we've got an expression for di by dx as an integral. Now we want to evaluate this new integral. So to do that, um, we are going to make a substitution. Uh, and since we've got this ln t term in our numerator there, let's let um, some new variable u be equal to ln t. Uh, and what that implies, if we just invert that relationship, is that t is e to the u. And so if we differentiate that um, uh, relation between t and u, we get dt is e to the u du. Because when you differentiate e to the u with respect to u, you get back the same thing. So let's do our change of variables. So firstly, let's think about the limits, actually. Now, um, previously, the limits when we're integrating with respect to t were 0 and infinity. Now when t goes towards 0, um, what's going to happen? Well, if we look at this, t is e to the u. Um, how do you take some number, exponentiate it, and get 0? Well, you can't actually do that. Um, but as the exponent u goes towards minus infinity, then e to the u goes to 0. And so we can put this lower limit as minus infinity, because if we raise e to some really large negative power, we get something that tends towards 0. Um, and then, well, e to the infinity is still infinity, uh, or to put it another way, the natural log of infinity is still infinity, so um, the upper limit can stay as it is. And then, uh, okay, let's start doing the substitution in the integrand. So we've got this minus sign, and then t to the x is going to be e to the x u. Okay, simply because t is e to the u, so we get e to the x u. Uh, then ln t is u, by definition and dt was e to the u du. Right, so there you go, e to the u du. 
Um, and then we're going to have a big uh, fraction. So uh, what's going to go on the denominator? Well, we are simply going to get 1 plus e to the x u squared. Again, because t to the x, um, well, sorry, because t is e to the u, and we just raise that to the power of x. Uh, then we've got 1 plus t squared. t squared is going to be e to the t uh, to 2u. Sorry, so we get 1 plus e to the 2u. So um, let's simplify this a tiny bit. So let's put out the minus sign, and then we get the integral from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, if we collect up our exponents in the numerator, uh, well, first we've got this u, um, and then we've got e to the x plus 1 times u. Okay, just collected up the two exponential terms together. Uh, and then the denominator, I think, is going to be the same. Oh, I forgot the du, so du. And then, yeah, we've just got 1 plus e to the x u squared times 1 plus e to the 2 u. Right, so at this point, you might be thinking this integral looks even more difficult than what we started with, but there is a nice way to evaluate this new integral. Um, we're going to do it using symmetry. So if we um, define, let's say, f of u, just to be the integrand um, without this, like we, we don't have to include that minus sign in front there. If we define f of u to basically be all of the stuff under the integral sign, uh, we get ue to the x plus 1 u divided by um, 1 plus e to the x u squared times 1 plus e to the 2 u. Now, let's investigate the symmetry of this function, because symmetry can often help us with integrals uh, when we're integrating over all possible values of, uh, of u. So what we want to do is think about f of minus u. So what happens when we switch the sign of u? Well, uh, we get a minus u, and then we get e to the minus x plus 1 u. And on the denominator, uh, we get 1 plus e to the minus x u squared times 1 plus e to the minus 2 u. So all I've done is put a minus sign everywhere, um, everywhere that there is a u. Uh, but let's think about how we can simplify that new expression. So OK, we've got our minus u e to the minus x plus 1 u. Uh, what can we do with this denominator? Well, what would happen if we multiplied the top and the bottom of this fraction by e to the 2xu? So what I'm going to do is multiply the top and the bottom by e to the 2xu. And then what's going to happen is, um, well, because e to the 2xu is the same as e to the xu all squared, right? what's going to happen is that's going to affect this first bracket. OK, so more specifically, what's going to happen uh, is that we're going to get e to the um, x u plus 1 all squared, right? Because we've multiplied the bottom by e to the x u all squared. And so we just um, put that factor inside the bracket. The 1 becomes e to the x u, the e to the minus x u becomes 1. Uh, and then let's also multiply up by e to the 2 u so that we can do something with that second bracket on the denominator. So the 1 becomes uh, e to the 2u. And then e to the minus 2u, when we multiply by e to the 2u, um, we just get e to the 0, which is 1. Now, we are about to arrive at a kind of interesting result, because if we just collect up all of the exponents on the numerator, we get minus u e. Um, now, OK, so if we look at the x u terms, right, we have a minus x u term from that first exponent, but then we have a plus 2 x u. And so we've got plus x u in total. Um, and similarly, for the u terms, right, we've got an e to the minus u from this first exponent, and we've got e to the plus 2 u from, the, from this uh, exponent over on the far right. And so we have overall just a single e to the u, and then we can factorize that to give e to the x plus 1 times u, right? So e to the x plus 1 times u. Um, and maybe uh, I can just copy all of that stuff on the denominator and put it there. Now notice that we've got back 
almost what we started with, right? If you look back at this definition of f of u, we've got almost the same thing, except there's a minus sign in front of it, right? So that's minus f of u. And so what we've shown is that f of minus u is minus f of u, which is exactly the definition of an odd function. Now, when you integrate an odd function from minus infinity to infinity, you get zero, um, which is because you can understand that in terms of, um, you know, the integral being the area under the curve, uh, but it's the signed area under the curve, right? And so if it's an odd function, there is a positive net area on one side, but a negative net area on the other side, but by symmetry, they're going to be exactly equal. And when you add them together, you'll get zero, which means this integral di by dx is in fact zero. Okay, so there we go. Um, we find that, that di by dx is zero. In other words, i does not actually depend on x at all. So i is a constant. That's pretty interesting. It's not obvious just from looking at the form of the integral, right, that it's not actually going to depend on x at all. So if i is a constant and it doesn't depend on x, then we can just choose whatever value of x we want that allows us to actually calculate it. And I think the simplest possible value of x we can choose is zero. Um, and so if we substitute x equals zero into our original expression for i of x up here, then what's going to happen? Well, t to the zero on the denominator here, t to the zero is just going to be one, right? And so um, what we get is that it's the integral from zero to infinity. Well, the first bracketed term in the integrand is just one plus one, which is two. So we can pull out a factor of a half uh, and then we get dt over one plus t squared. Now this is actually a pretty standard result. We can do this using a trig substitution. Um, I'm not going to go through that in full detail here, but the integral of dt over 1 plus t squared is arctan of t, uh, and so um, we get half of arctan of t uh, between 0 and infinity, um, and arctan of infinity is pi over 2, arctan of 0 is 0, so we get a half of pi over 2, which is pi over 4, and we're done. So there's our result. That's pretty cool, and quite a nice way of doing it, I think. Um, firstly, we showed that i doesn't depend on x at all, and then we just chose a value of x that made it convenient for us to calculate the integral.